Hello and welcome to Sophie Ridge on Sunday. What would we have thought a year ago if we'd been told the government was considering allowing us to sit on a park bench with one person from another household and that this would be front page news? Like a lot of the last things in the last 12 months, it would have felt pretty surreal. But that's where we are as we wait for clarity from the government about how lockdown will be eased. To be fair, it's only one part of the speculation floating around. There's big questions about schools, shops and hospitality as well. And today we'll be trying to get some answers. We've got just the lineup for it. In a moment, we'll be joined by the Foreign Secretary, Dominic Raab. The First Minister of Wales, Mark Drakeford, will be on the programme today, as well Professor Tim Spector from King's College London, who runs a leading study tracking the progress of COVID-19 in an app. The Shadow Chief Secretary to the Treasury, Bridget Phillipson, will be looking ahead to the budget. And as she prepares to step down as Children's Commissioner for England, we'll also be hearing from Anne Longfield. But first, the government set a target to offer a first vaccine to all over 70s NHS and care workers and care home residents by tomorrow. So, will they meet that target? Well, let's ask a man who should hopefully know, the Foreign Secretary, Dominic Raab. Thank you for being on the programme this morning. Good morning. So, the government's target is to vaccinate the top four priority groups by tomorrow. Are you going to meet the target? Well, there's been huge progress made and we're confident we're on track to do so. We'll obviously get the final data um, later on today and tomorrow. And it will be a really important milestone because that's the top four priority groups uh, that have been offered the first do dose. And it is the, uh, if you like, the first milestone towards the wider plan to get 99% of those at risk of dying vaccinated with the first dose um, by uh, the end of April. And then everyone in the country uh, every adult in the country offered a first dose by uh, the autumn and that's part of the roadmaps. So uh, the NHS teams, I was down at my local vaccination centre in Walton, the volunteers there, uh, Nadim Zahawi, Matt Hancock have done a, a great job. But of course, uh, this is only the first step in the vaccination rollout. It's going well, but we've got to keep it up. You must know if you're going to meet the target by tomorrow. Are you just leaving it for your boss to announce? Well, I'm confident we're on track to do so. Uh, they, the, the, the numbers look good, but I, I want to wait until we've got the formally published uh, figures so that we're doing it accurately and, and in the right way. So uh, I can't quite jump the gun, uh, but I can tell you that we're on track and we're confident that we will meet that target. Uh, and of course, the target was uh, come, come Monday, so come tomorrow. So uh, uh, you'll get the full um, data then, but it's a, a really important first step uh, in the vaccine rollout. Uh, and we then evaluate all of the data and the Prime Minister on the 22nd of February, so Monday week, will set out the plans going forward because, of course, we understand people want to know a bit more uh, what the next stage will involve. They want that light at the end of the tunnel. And it's right that we do it this way based on the evidence. And so far, the evidence is, is positive. Pretty clear that you're confident the vaccine rollout is going well so far. Now, on Friday, the Prime Minister is going to be hosting this virtual G7 meeting. Uh, he's going to call for further international cooperation on vaccine distribution, saying that governments have a responsibility to work together to put those vaccines to the best possible use. So does that mean that we are planning to give some of our vaccines to other countries? And if so, when would we do that? At what point would we do, would we do that? And who would we prioritise? Of course, we're not going to do anything that would undermine the integrity of the domestic rollout. That would be counterproductive. And it's fair to say we have already contributed on the international track. So these aren't binary choices. We've uh, contributed uh, over half a billion pounds. That will secure uh, over a billion doses through what's called the COVAX AMC facility. So we're already just not... To, um, just to jump in, sorry, you say that you wouldn't do anything to undermine the domestic rollout. So what does that actually mean? Does that mean you're not going to give any vaccines away until every adult in the UK has received their first dose? What does that mean? Well, uh, so first of all, we are already supporting and indeed leading the way with our G7 presidency of the international approach. We've uh, contributed uh, enough money to produce uh, one billion of those doses. And what we want to do is, having led the way, encourage and cajole and use our uh, convening power to get other countries to match that. That's the way we deal with the global um, challenge that we all face. I think the, the, the answer to your question is, would we use any surplus 
uh, vaccines from the uh, 450 million doses that we've got for the domestic rollout, we, we'd, we'd need to, we'll, before we start looking at that, we'll need to know with confidence that we're able to roll out reliably according to the timescales that we've got. So, but these things go in parallel. Um, we're leading the way, I think, domestically with our rollout, but also internationally. And so what the Prime Minister is doing is making sure with that uh, strong example that we're setting, we can also encourage others to make sure that the vulnerable countries, the poorest countries around the world, uh, are also able to benefit from equitable distribution of the vaccine. We need a global solution to what is a global pandemic. OK, um, now let's talk a bit about the light at the end of the tunnel that you mentioned. Cases are dropping. Uh, it seems like you're on course to meet the targets uh, tomorrow uh, on vaccines. Now, the government wants to reopen schools from the 8th of March. What I want to know is, are you planning on reopening all schools to all pupils at the same time? Or are you considering a staggered approach where, for example, primary schools might go back first or some pupils in exam year groups might go back first? Yes, no, it's a, a good question. And, and I know there'll be many teachers and parents that want uh, to know those answers, which is why with the approach we've taken, we've always said that on the uh, 22nd of February, so Monday week, the Prime Minister will review all the evidence, the impact of the lockdown, the impact of the vaccine uh, on the transmission rate and the number of people going into hospitals with coronavirus. We'll then set out the forward look. But you're absolutely right. On the 8th of March, we are aiming, we are hoping to get schools back. The precise details of we need to just make sure we set out once we've uh, evaluated all of that evidence. So the Prime Minister will give more of a steer on the 22nd, but the aim is to get schools uh, reopening in a responsible way on the 8th. So is, is the answer then, you haven't decided yet whether that's going to be all schools or some schools, that's dependent on the data? Yeah, I think we need to wait to evaluate the data carefully and uh, allow those plans to be put in place. And of course, the consultation goes into them, uh, because I know that's important for the stakeholders, for the schools uh, and others. And then the Prime Minister uh, on Monday week will be able to set out the full detail. But because we're making progress, I think we can feel confident that we will be able to uh, start that process of getting schools open on the 8th. And of course, uh, there'll be other measures that the Prime Minister will want to set out. Uh, but it'll be based on the evidence and the success that we've had uh, on, in terms of rolling out the vaccine and the impact that has, not just on reducing the number of cases, um, but also reducing the pressure on the NHS. OK. Now, the Sunday Times and the Sunday Telegraph are both reporting that at the same time, uh, there could be some minor relaxation of other rules. The government could announce, they say, that adults will be allowed to sit down outside on a park bench with one friend. So is it really against the rules right now for you to sit down on a park bench with one other person? Is Matt Hancock going to be you know, patrolling parks and slapping you with a 10-year jail sentence if he finds you? But you're not going to get a 10-year jail sentence for a, a minor mistake on a park bench, but it is absolutely right that until we change the rules, we need full compliance because that's the way we make the, the progress that I've described. I, I can't tell you all the changes that will be made um, because that's the point of having this review uh, point on the 22nd of February. Um, but what our priority will be is schools, as, a, as I mentioned. I think also um, it's fair to say getting non-essential retail open is going to be very important. And we also, I mean, you mentioned things like the ability to socialise uh, with people outside. These things are quality of life issues. They, they really matter. Um, so they're not small things. We understand that. I appreciate that. I'm sure everyone watching the show uh, does. But we do need to be very careful in how we proceed. We've made good progress. We don't want to see that unravel because we go too far too quick. As you say, you know, these aren't small things. and there, there is a serious point to the question. You know, if you're elderly or if you're, you're pregnant, going for a walk, your piece of exercise with one person from another household, which is legal, and if you sit down on a park bench for a moment, is that unlawful? Are you breaking the rules? Well, I think the rules are pretty clear. That the, the, the idea is not to have people socialising, but to follow the very clear guidance for outdoor uh, activity, which is... But can you sit down on a park bench? The main tone. But it all depends on the context. And in, and in truth, of course, the media will pick up on the odd story here and there. But the police have done an incredible job in applying uh, rigour, but also some common sense. So no one wants to pick up people that inadvertently find themselves for a split second in the wrong place. What we do want to make sure is people aren't flouting the rules. That is how we get back control of the virus. That's what we have, uh, the data shows that we're achieving. 
We don't want to see um, that unraveling. So, it, so it is it, it is important. But I think we can trust the police uh, in their interactions with the public to get that balance right. Overwhelmingly, they have uh, over the course of this pandemic. OK, now a group of your Conservative colleagues have written to the Prime Minister. They say there's no justification for any restrictions to remain beyond the end of April because by then all nine priority groups should have been given a vaccine dose and those groups, of course, represent 99% of COVID deaths, around 80% of hospitalisations. Are they wrong? Well, that's our aim. That's the roadmap to get 99% of those who are at risk of dying from this uh, what, the roadmap to ease all restrictions by the end of April? That's no, not no, the plan, though, is it? No, you're, you're putting words in my mouth. The, the plan is to get the 99% of people at risk of dying uh, dispensed their first dose by the end of April, certainly offered their first dose. And by doing so and taking the fatality out of this uh, virus, uh, we are in a much better position to proceed to start to ease the um, the lockdown. And uh, we've just talked about the way we're going to do it, starting with schools and essential retail. I don't think you can set, though, an arbitrary target and not be evidence-led, which is why the review point on the 22nd of February is so important. We can see the success we've made. Um, and, and as you rightly point out, the we, we, we look on the course to hit the first milestone tomorrow. Then there is, by the end of April, to have uh, a further 70 million people uh, offered their first dose. And we want every adult offered their first dose by September. That's the roadmap we've set out. We need to be evidence-based in analysing our progress towards it. But they're saying that if those people are vaccinated, all nine priority groups, then restrictions should end. Do you agree yeah, with that or not? We're, we're not taking a, a what, what feels to me slightly arbitrary uh, commitment without reviewing the impact the measures have had on the transmission and the hospital admissions of the virus. So in, in that sense, we are making sure that as we go and we take the, the, the steps, both on the vaccine, but then in due course, as we open up schools, of course, we want to see what impact that has on the virus. And, and we need to retain some flexibility to deal with the variants, uh, which of course are part and parcel of dealing with the pandemic, but do alter the precise time frame. So we'll be evidence-led, but we share the, the, the ambition to get out of a lockdown, to transition to a better place for economic reasons, for jobs, for livelihoods, for the most honourable in our society and for everyone's mental health. And Professor Neil Ferguson this week um, of Imperial College told me that some low-level restrictions, face mask wearing, could even go into next year. Do, do you think that's realistic? Well, I just don't want to jump the gun on the series of uh, measures that the Prime Minister will announce and the roadmap. Okay. Uh, all of these things will be looked at in the round. OK. Now, from tomorrow, uh, arrivals from certain countries will have to go into hotel quarantine. So how many hotels are currently signed up and how many rooms has the government booked? Oh, I don't know the uh, precise number of rooms booked, but you're right to say there are 33 countries in the high risk, the red list, if you like, uh, particularly from South America and from Africa. And in relation to British nationals coming home, so you wouldn't be able to, if you're a foreign national coming from those countries, you wouldn't be able to uh, come back. There's a bar on uh, entry into the UK. But if you're a British national or resident trying to get back home, we will have a system of uh, government commissioned uh, uh, hotel-based quarantine for the 10 days, subject to two tests, and a lot of preparation has gone into that to make sure, and it's only one uh, additional measure, if you like, one extra safeguard in the lines of defence that we've got against new variants coming in, but I do think it's significant and important on top of the other border-based restrictions we've now got in place. The Times reported yesterday that so far only 16 hotels have signed up, none of them north of Birmingham, and that we could run out of rooms by Thursday because there's only 5,000 booked and we're expecting 1,400 arrivals a day. So uh, I understand you, you're probably not across the detail of exactly how many rooms, but are we going to have enough? I think we will. And of course, I mean, the truth is that the, the travel has largely uh, dried up in any event. But what this measure allows is... Uh, uh, 1,400 arrivals a day is quite a lot still, isn't it? No, it's nowhere near comp comparison to the kind of travel. I mean, I've, uh, when if you look at Heathrow um, Airport or any of our airports, uh, they're, they're, uh, they're empty compared to what we've seen previously. But what we do need to make sure we've got is a safe, reliable, workable system for UK nationals from those uh, 33 high-risk countries uh, so that we don't find unwittingly uh, 
uh, or otherwise, that the progress made in terms of the vaccine and control of the virus is undermined. And those plans are now being properly implemented. Uh, we've taken our time to get them right and they'll be, we'll be able to deliver them from Monday. You talked there about 33 countries being on the red list, but of course there are other countries where the South Africa variant, the variant of concern, has been found. Austria, for example, the Austrian region of Tyrol went into lockdown on Tuesday after 293 cases of the South Africa variant were concerned. Austria isn't on the list. Isn't it not time to have a blanket ban? Now, I'm not sure that's proportionate. And, of course, um, having blanket bans on any, for example, uh, air travel into the UK would be very difficult for the supply chains, things like freight, which sometimes come in the But you can of exempt that. freight. You can exempt freight, can't you? That's what France has done. Well, you, look, there are different ways of looking at it. We assess the data very carefully. So whenever uh, there is an outbreak or a deterioration in one or other country, we look at it very carefully. Um, and we, what we want to make sure is we've got as targeted measures as possible to keep those supply chains open, to make sure uh, British nationals or residents can come back from abroad, but also to avoid undermining the progress we've made. And we think we've got the right balance, robust measures, but targeted measures. OK, do we know how many cases of the South Africa variant there are currently in the UK? Uh, I don't have that data. I'm not sure it's ascertainable. And of course, people refer to it as the South African variant. Um, actually, the South Africans have a bit more advanced than many other countries in the genomic testing. So the, the question is where the variant first uh, is tracked. Um, and we've, of course, had a, a similar issue. We, we're world leaders in genomic testing and we're very transparent about things. Um, so, uh, like the South Africans, so the, the truth is these variants, as in the course of any pandemic and any virus, happen. Um, and the, the point is that we've got the measures in place, the tracking, the expertise in genomic sequencing and the international collaboration, the cooperation we have with countries around the world to make sure we can track it very carefully and take proportionate measures. Now, I just want to finish by asking you about Anne Sekoulis, the American woman involved in the 2019 crash that killed the teenager Harry Dunn. Now, she claimed diplomatic immunity, returned to the US. They've since refused to extradite her. Now, 10 days ago, her barrister told a US court that she was employed by an intelligence agency in the US at the time of the crash, which was especially a factor in her departure from the UK. Now, this matters because if she was employed herself, she wouldn't have had diplomatic immunity. So when did you or the Prime Minister first become aware that Antsikoulis was employed by an intelligence agency at the time of the crash? Yeah, well, look, first of all, we don't um, comment on intelligence matters, but what I can tell you categorically, because it's not quite right what you've said, is at the time that Antsikoulis was in the UK and the basis uh, of her immunity was as the uh, partner of an officer at the embassy. Um, and, and that was the, uh, the basis for it. Um, and we obviously sought waiver of immunity um, and we've sought her return uh, under extradition and we continue to do so. And of course, I've raised it with the new US Secretary of State. Um, we want to see justice for uh, the, the family of Harry Dunn and we do believe that Dan Sekoulis should return. So did the US not tell you that she was employed by the US intelligence agencies at the time of the crash as her lawyer has said? Well, Sophie, as I said, first of all, we don't comment on intelligence matters, but what I can tell you categorically is that her status was uh, as the partner, the spouse uh, of uh, an officer of the embassy, and that was the way both the US with us and uh, approached things and the way we did. And the other speculation had no impact and wouldn't have had any, uh, any uh, effect on the status that she had in the UK. So you know it now. We all know it now, because it's been widely reported. When did you first find out that she was employed by the US intelligence services? So, Sophie, you can ask me the question as many times as you like. I don't comment and uh, uh, pass comment on intelligence matters at all. Uh, but what I can say categorically, and we've been clear with the, the, the family as well about this, is that her status was very clear and it was based on her being the, the wife of an officer uh, uh, of the embassy uh, uh, up at Crowton. So that was the basis on which um, she had immunity. We, of course, wanted it waived. We, of course, wanted her to be returned after she'd left, and that remains our position. So can you guarantee that you didn't know that she was employed by an intelligence agency before she left for the US? So if I can guarantee that I don't comment on intelligence matters, as many okay. times as you wish to ask me. OK. Uh, Dominic Robb, thank you for coming on the programme today. Much appreciated. Good to talk to you.
Dominic Raab uh, there, he did sound uh, quite confident that we we're on track to meet that target to offer a vaccine to the top four priority groups by tomorrow. Now, the first part of the UK to meet that target was Wales and the country's First Minister, Mark Drakeford, joins us now. Thank you for being on the programme this morning, Mr Drakeford. Good morning. So, congratulations on meeting the target. How did you do it so fast? Well, I think it's the... All the credit is due to those frontline workers in our health service. Uh, their partners in the armed forces, our local authorities, the volunteers. Uh, it's the efforts that they have made in every part of Wales that allowed us to get to the first target by the end of Friday and mopping up the small numbers of people who may have missed out the first time they were invited for a vaccination over this weekend. OK. Now, we talked a bit with Dominic Raag about the idea of this uh, hotel quarantine. Uh, travellers coming back from hotels in the red list, if you like, of countries will have to self-isolate in a hotel. How many quarantine hotels are there in Wales? There won't be any in Wales at this point because we don't have any flights coming into Wales from those red countries. In fact, we don't have any flights coming in from abroad at all and won't do until March. And people coming through the ports into Wales are covered by the common travel area. So it, Scotland and England both will have ports of entry covered by the quarantine uh, in hotels arrangement. But at this time and for several weeks to come, that will not affect us here in Wales. I mean, you've been quite critical, haven't you, of the government's approach to uh, quarantine, of course. Uh, there may not be direct flights to Wales, but people entering the country uh, clearly affects uh, all of us. Do you think there needs to be more than 33 countries on the red list where you have to quarantine if you return from there? Well, I would have done it in the opposite way to the UK government. Uh, their approach is to say that uh, everybody can come in other than the people on the red list. I would have said nobody can come in other than a list of countries where we are absolutely sure that it is safe for people to come without the sort of quarantine arrangements that are being suggested. I just feel that we need to build the wall higher to make sure that we are not vulnerable to new variants that could appear in any part of the world. You know, one appeared here in this country and has now spread elsewhere. So my own view has been that we ought to build that wall higher, protect us all from the risks that new variants pose and only allow a lower level of protection from those relatively few countries where we can be very sure that the risks are low. Have you made that case to the Prime Minister? Uh, certainly made it to UK ministers. We do now have a weekly meeting between the First Ministers and uh, Michael Gove as the Minister in charge of the Cabinet Office. We discuss it there. I've certainly made that point there. And what was the reaction? Well, I, I don't think the UK government's persuaded by uh, what I've suggested. Uh, I've described previously the approach of the UK government as one in which they do the least that they think th that they can get away with, uh, rather than the most that is needed. And we know that those tensions are there inside the UK cabinet, with some ministers wanting to go further than the current arrangements. Uh, I just make the points that I make on behalf of Wales and uh, on behalf of the approach that we have always taken, which is to be careful, cautious, always doing the most we can to protect people here from this public health emergency. You say that in Wales you're careful and cautious and always doing the most you can, but on schools you're actually uh, doing more when it comes to reopening and easing restrictions than the UK government is. Uh, Boris Johnson says that nothing's going to happen before the 8th of March. Well, in Wales, schools will be phased in from the 22nd of February. You know, the R rate in Wales is only just below one. Are you worried that it could rise above one when some of those schools and some of those pupils start returning to the classroom? Well, we're able to do this because we went into a national lockdown here in Wales before Christmas. Uh, and the impact of that is now being felt very significantly. When we went into the national lockdown, the numbers in Wales of people per 100,000 contracting coronavirus was over 650. It's under 100 in Wales today. Positivity rates are falling. The number of people in hospital with coronavirus is falling. That is what has created a small amount of headroom for us to bring the very youngest children back into school from the 22nd of February. But what we will do is then to 
monitor that very carefully indeed, because the Kent variant, which is so much more aggressive and can be transmitted so much more uh, easily, we will want to make sure that those first steps aren't resulting in the virus getting away from us again and the R number rising. So these are tentative and first steps which will be carefully monitored. Hopefully, of course, we hope that uh, things will continue to improve. We want to get children back into school as fast as it is safe to do that. You say that you're going to be carefully monitoring things. Does that mean you could actually close primary schools again then if the data moves in the wrong direction? Yes, the, the advice to us from our chief medical officer and scientists is, is that you should, in the, these early stages, you should always take measures that could be reversed quickly if you needed to do that. So if there were to be unintended consequences from having three to seven-year-olds back into school, then of course we would be able to go into reverse. Now, we absolutely don't want to do that. Uh, we want to see things continuing to improve. We want this to be the first step on the journey to getting more children back into the classroom. But if things were to uh, go against us, if a new variant were to appear, for example, then we could go back to the position we're in today with no children other than the vulnerable and those of key workers currently in face-to-face -face education. OK. Um, there have been calls from Labour for teachers to be prioritised and moved up the vaccine queue just to try and get schools uh, reopen. That's obviously against the advice, the advice of the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation. Do you agree or disagree with Keir Starmer there? Uh, well, we don't take the same uh, view uh, on that matter. We follow the advice of the JCBI. The JCBI will be considering the case for professional groups being moved up the priority list. If their advice changes, our approach will change. While their advice continues to be to focus on the top nine priority groups, then that is what we will do. Do you think that he's ignoring the science then, uh, the Labour leader, by calling for the advice of the JCBI to be overridden? Well, as I understand it, what Keir Starmer has asked is for the case for uh, teachers to be carefully considered by the JCBI. And if they Which they're doing be... anyway. Well, I, I believe they are doing that. And if they can be moved up the priority list, then that is what the JCBI will conclude and that is what we will do. But as a government here in Wales, we have said from the outset, alongside other governments, we will follow the advice of the JCBI. At the moment, it isn't to move teachers to the front of the queue. If and when that changes, then our approach will change alongside it. I just wonder if this is feeds into what some people's concerns are about Keir Starmer's handling of the pandemic. He's effectively calling for the JCBI to consider advice that they're already considering. Is he if you like, just calling for things that are inevitable. And are you concerned at all uh, about his leadership, given the fact uh, that the Conservatives seem to have received uh, a bit of a bounce in the polls, even if it's short term, in response to the vaccine rollout? No, I think Keir Starmer has done an excellent job in holding this government to account, in making sure that they have to carefully consider the issues that matter to people across the United Kingdom, including here in Wales. It's our top priority as a government to get children back into the classroom as safely as we can. And I completely understand why there is a debate around whether or not teachers should be moved up the queue for vaccination. Uh, as I say, we, we follow the advice of the JCVI. It's what you have to do uh, as a government. But I don't think that it was wrong uh, of Sir Keir Starmer to raise the issue. And I think he has been extraordinarily effective uh, in making sure that the Prime Minister is answerable for the actions that he takes. OK, uh, thank you very much for coming on the programme this morning. Mark Drakeford there. Thank you. Now, we've already heard on today's show that any lockdown easing will be guided by the data. There are still thousands of cases and hundreds of deaths every day, but things do seem to be moving in the right direction. Now, as you can see, the number of daily cases is coming down. Fluctuations, of course, but the blue line, that's the rolling seven-day average has clearly fallen from the peak around Christmas and New Year. So is the virus definitely receding? And what does it mean for easing restrictions? Well, we can ask Professor Tim Spector from King's College at London. Uh, thank you very much for uh, being with us. Now, your COVID symptom study app lets 4.5 million people report their symptoms. Pretty comprehensive 
database. What is it showing in terms of uh, the virus and how many cases there are currently? Well, the Zoe app, as we call it colloquially, has, has been showing that since the 1st of January, cases have been falling across the country and the R value has really been persistently below one during that time. And so we now have, uh, we've dropped by about 80% uh, since that time. So uh, it, it currently means that um, we're at a similar state to where we were in, oct in October. And if we look at the trajectories of where we're going, uh, in a couple of weeks, we're going to be where we were uh, at the end of May, beginning of June, if people can remember that far back uh, last year. So that means that we'll be below a prevalence, which is the number of people affected, uh, have symptomatic COVID, of less than one in 500, which uh, in my view means that we should be able to <coughs> uh, reduce some of these restrictions uh, and I'm particularly concerned that we uh, get kids back to school as long as possible because of the known long-term uh, negative effects of that. So I'm, the, other, the other consideration, of course, is what's going on in the NHS. And that's what people argue as a reason we shouldn't um, you know, reduce these restrictions too quickly. And, and uh, the data are showing, again, um, um, about a 60% drop in hospital admissions and a about 50% drop in the number of percentage of people who are in hospital with COVID uh, since the worst worst of this, which was about the second week of January. So you mentioned, all of them um, looking quite good. You mentioned schools there. Um, you know, we just spoke to Mark Drakeford, obviously in Wales, they are uh, reopening primary schools at a quicker rate uh, than in England. The Prime Minister said that he hopes to allow schools to reopen from the 8th of March. Do you think it should be done earlier than that then? Um, I think it's going to, if it was up to me, I would say there are some regions where it could be open up earlier, uh, particularly in rural areas where they have very low rates of um, disease. And particularly if you focused on the low risk group, which is the youngest uh, children who uh, really pose very little risk uh, to themselves or uh, other people. So, but I think, to be honest, if we had a definite date of, of the 8th of March and uh, we stuck to it, I think most parents around the country would be happy because that would give them time to prepare as well. Because what people don't like is having sudden switches in policy overnight, which can also uh, cause problems. Yes, definitely. When you're trying to kind of prepare home learning and obviously the teachers as well, the logistics of it too. Um, Professor Neil Ferguson told me uh, this week that we could see low level restrictions like face mask wearing at big public gatherings, even into next year. Do you think that's true or do you think we could see a complete return to normal earlier? Um, my belief is that it isn't a yes, no scenario. We're not gonna suddenly wake up one day and say, uh, we're all cured, you know, like in the Hollywood movies and uh, wave flags. Uh, it's going to be a, a slow decrease out of this where we're going to have to need to be cautious about new variants coming in, uh, keeping an eye on how our vaccines are doing. And so it makes sense to be sensible for a while longer whilst still keeping the vast majority of our social life and economic life and educational life going. So um, I've said before, I, I see a scenario and it's not necessarily what I want. And I get criticised whenever I mention scenarios, as does Neil Ferguson. But um, I can see us uh, carrying on uh, using masks in certain situations. And why not have uh, wash your hands when you go to the supermarket or you're touching food? Um, these are things that other countries routinely do. If you look at Japan, uh, they do uh, wear masks uh, every winter and it may not be compulsory it may maybe but I think this is the sort of scenario we're going to see but I'm also an optimist and I, I believe that um, we're going to drive the levels of this virus really low and the combination of uh, also the vaccine success and um, I wanted to come on and if we can talk about that a bit as well because well our app is also uh, showing us some very good data on the vaccine. What, what is the app showing on the vaccine then? 
Well, so we've now got about a third of a million people who've logged their first dose of a vaccine with us on the Zoe app. And anyone who's listening, please, if you had a vaccine, do, do log, it, log with us. And we're showing very low levels of side effects. And we're showing that after three weeks, we're getting a 67% um, protection uh, against the virus. So like three times less um, uh, risk than you'd be, you'd be getting otherwise compared to uh, unprotected controls. So that's much perhaps a better rate than people had thought just on a single jab. And so I think that combined with the data we're seeing uh, is gives me a lot of reason to be optimistic that uh, we're going to be in a much better place in two to four weeks time and, and can start to uh, reduce some of these restrictions. That's really encouraging. What kind of sample size is it for the vaccine data? You know? uh, well, we've analysed about the first 50,000 uh, people, so it's a large sample. And these are healthcare workers who are at high risk, so uh, they're the ones you would see uh, changes in most. And we're seeing a consistent fall that no protection at all in the first two weeks, but uh, and that's important for people to notice because I think people rush out and think they're cured. Um, there's high risk of infection then, and we are seeing lots of cases. But after two weeks, it drops to about 46%. And now three weeks to six weeks, it's 67%, which uh, is really great. If ever, that was around the country, you know, uh, then we'd, we'd have really knocked this uh, virus on the head. How do you work out the 67%? Uh, we compare it to a group of control uh, individuals who are healthcare workers of the same age and sex who uh, have been logging with us and haven't had the vaccine. So it's not the same as a, a randomised trial. The data is not as clear cut, but it's a real life situation. And there's often people say that um, the trials sort of over, overestimate the benefits of vaccines. So this is the first large scale real, uh, real time data we have on, on, on this of a single jab. So um, it's still preliminary. We're still uh, analysing the results every week as people give us more data, but it, it's, it's just to say that it's looking very promising and that the, the government's approach of delaying the second shot in order to get more people vaccinated uh, yes. looks like it, it's paying off. Now, you are able to report lots of different symptoms on your app. Um, at the minute, though, you're only many people are only eligible for a COVID test if you display a cough, a fever or a loss of smell and taste. Now, my producers always say that I shouldn't use anything to do in my own life because it's anecdotal, but I recently had COVID and had none of those three symptoms, so wouldn't have been eligible uh, for a test. Do you think the symptom range needs to be expanded? And is there evidence that with the new variants, we're seeing different symptoms? Well, we've been saying since last spring that the, the range of symptoms should be expanded. And this has been clear from the people reporting on our app, where there are over 20 symptoms of COVID that are, that are linked. And we've done, uh, we've published papers and, and continue to do research showing the same things happening is that 30% of people uh, who have a positive PCR test, uh, uh, as perhaps you did, do not have those three classic symptoms. And this is particularly true in the first three days of the illness when uh, it's most infectious. So. I understand why we didn't do this last spring, because we didn't have any testing and it would have uh, crashed the system. Now we have a fantastic testing system, able to do over 600,000 tests a day. We do have the capacity to do it. This is the time to do that. And we would reduce uh, infections by 30% in reality, because these people would be told to stay at home. And at the moment, it's, you know, it's a, a real risk that we are ignoring and all these smoke screens of testing asymptomatic people is far less productive than getting to these people that uh, actually have symptoms and are spreading the virus around. So absolutely. Um, it was, uh, I've forgotten your other question. That was it, I think. That's all good. Oh, I, oh, I did ask if the new variant uh, leads to yeah. different symptoms. It's interesting that the, the jury's out on this. The, the ONS uh, survey, which is a similar size to us, but very different methodology, showed that there was more evidence of headaches and, and fatigue and um, sort of sore throats. 
uh, whereas our data, which has been consistent since, since the beginning, has shown no difference. So uh, I, I think we don't know yet. I think it's, we need to keep a close eye on it. But if everyone was more aware that, you know, the two common symptoms of early COVID are headache and fatigue and sore, and then you've got sore throat and sore muscles, then actually everyone would be safer. So I think it's, it's a good debate to keep going on and keep looking at. Mm. Now, you said recently that you don't watch the Number 10 news conferences anymore. Why not? Um, well, I, uh, I, I've overdone on COVID stats, I guess. And I also, um, I, I also get a bit disheartened by the fact that we only focus on certain of those statistics. So uh, the fact that not just the number 10, but also the media focus on the number of deaths that day. And I think it's a very misleading statistic because um, I can't remember what the date, you know, it's very sad people die uh, of anything. But for example, yesterday around 600 people died of COVID, but uh, on a normal uh, day in February, 1500 people would die mostly of heart disease, strokes, um, cancer, et cetera, so, or the flu. So we never put those statistics into any uh, context. And I think this has got a lot of people extremely anxious um, and you know, are petrified to leave their homes and may have real problems coming out again if we don't put these stats into some real perspective that yes, uh, rates are high, people are dying from COVID, but they also die from other things. Many of those people are uh, not seeking help in the NHS. They are having mental health problems. Uh, they're not getting their cancer looked at, not looking after their heart, et cetera. So I just would like to see also uh, perhaps less fear mongering and more a general picture. And that's. Oh, we've just lost you. Um, we did get uh, through most of the interview, though. Uh, fascinating stuff. Professor Tim Spector there uh, from King's, the founder of the Zoe app. Now, we were talking about schools a lot on the programme with Dominic Raab, with Mark Drakeford, and also, of course, with Professor Spectre as well. Uh, the damage being done to children, their education and mental health by being out of the classroom uh, is something that, of course, looks set to continue for at least a few more weeks in England. Now, someone who wants to see more to done to address this is Anne Longfield, who's stepping down as Children's Commissioner next month, and she joins us now. Thank you for being on the programme. Good morning. Um, we're just hearing that some quite positive data from the Zoe app, but also uh, from the official case data as well, that case numbers do seem to be coming down. Uh, do you think that schools could reopen sooner than the 8th of March in England? Well, I certainly hope they can open as soon as possible, especially primary schools. And uh, I think parents and indeed children have their eyes on what is going to be said at the uh, press conference in a few days' time in terms of a roadmap but also whether their school will be opening on the 8th. It's, you know, we should remember that most kids have been out of school for just about a year. They've just had a few weeks back in. And of course, during that time, most have been falling behind in their education. They've been away from their friends and away from those support networks that are just so important to them, especially those that are more vulnerable. You said, especially primary schools at the beginning of your answer, do you think there is a case to allow younger pupils to return before secondary schools? Well, that's certainly something that um, countries across Europe have been doing. Um, I mean, the case is that those children are less able to work at home remotely. Uh, their, their parents need to be there um, because they need a greater level of care and support to learn. And they're much less likely to pick up that level of infection or, or indeed potentially transmit. So. Across Europe, you've got France, you've got Italy, you've got Spain, all of whom have primary schools now back open. Now, of course, there's exam years as well that we need to look at for older children. But certainly for primaries, there seems to be a trend that actually smaller entities can get back open and can be managed. Of course, catching up on a year of disrupted education is going to be really very difficult and um, what's it going to require and do you think we should look at things like shortening the school holiday for example to give a bit more time it's going to take a huge effort uh really this is kind of a, of a war effort kind of scale um there needs of course to be a boost for children uh, in terms of catch up in education terms in the classroom 
potentially as well, using some of those times, yes, in school holidays, the longer day. But part of that really needs to be as well about helping children to build back those social skills and that confidence. You know, they haven't been in school, but they haven't been going to their football classes either. They haven't been going to their karate classes. So all the fabric of children's lives have disappeared over the last year. So we need to see a really ambitious programme of recovery with, you know, significant investment now, I think, from government. I've always said children haven't had their nightingale moment yet. And this is the time, because I think the alternative is that there's a group of children who won't make up the time they've lost. These are the ones who started behind, who are struggling, potentially about one in six children. If they don't get that level of support and boost, they won't ever catch up during their time at school. And that's something that they and all of us will, um, uh, you know, reap the benefits um, or, or see, the, um, see the impact of. Yeah, one in six children maybe not ever catching up is really quite alarming. Um, I was also interested in what you say about the mental health aspect too, because it feels that we're very good at picking apart the academic impact of what the last year has been. But as you say, there are social impacts as well. Children spending all day looking at screens, young children in particular being told that they should be fearful of close mm -hmm. contact with other people. Mm -hmm. What do you think the consequences of this could be? Well, we already had a, a significant mental health problem for most children in this country, for many children in this country. Simon Stevens called it an epidemic only two years ago. But what we've had over the last year is really, you know, the shock of the pandemic, but also that lack of interaction with others, which at different ages has its impact. For very young children, I've had parents talk to me about how their children have become clingy, shy to talk to other children, not able to talk to other children in the park. Um, for primary school age children, actually a third of children told me last summer that they were worried about the, what the future would bring. You know, all of the things they expected to be around them and to be stable in their lives has suddenly gone. And then, of course, you know, those that are in secondary school and have their focus on exams and what comes next, there are a terrific uh, number of uh, uh, uncertainties for those children. So we know the prevalence, again, is one in six for those children as well in terms of probable mental health conditions. I'd like to see mental health teams in and around every school to really help children at the first instance before it falls into crisis. The Education Secretary, Gavin Williamson, has had a lot of criticism about the way that he's handled uh, the pandemic. What do you make of his performance? Well, look, I have left who sits around the Cabinet table very much as the Prime Minister. And, of course, it's been a difficult year with a lot um, to cope with. But I don't need to tell you that they have been difficulties over the last year and schools themselves will be the first to say that. Um, I'm pleased that the Prime Minister is taking the lead on this. I'm pleased that the emphasis now and that commitment is to put children and put schools at the heart of the opening up of uh, the economy and opening up of the country. Um, and I think that's where it needs to be because it's much more complex than just what goes on in schools. A whole range of factors need to be in place to ensure that schools open. And that now must be the priority. And just finally, research by the Joseph Roundtree Foundation this week has found that over 4 million children are living in poverty in the UK, over 1 million of them under the age of five. Given this, would you like to see the £20 a week uplift to universal credit extended? Yes, I think it does need to be extended. It's had an important impact and that needs to continue. This isn't the time for families to have that uncertainty or that drop in income. And what we do know with very young children that clearly... Uh, are bearing some of the brunt of that increase in poverty. If you fall behind before you get to school, you have very few chances to catch up during your school day. So the impact of those early years can have a huge impact on a child's life throughout. So it is so important. I think it's clear now we have a problem with poverty in this country. We really need a long-term plan as part of that build back to ensure that all children can flourish and all CAM families can give their children the support they want to. OK, uh, Anne Longfield, thank you so much for uh, coming on the programme this morning. Thank you.
Uh, before we move on, a reminder, do check out the Sophie Ridge on Sunday podcast. It features the best bits of our interviews each week, plus analysis from me and my producer, Matt Lavender. It's available from lunchtime on the Sky News app, Spotify and Apple Podcasts, so do check that out. Now, Labour is today calling for the debt built up by businesses during the pandemic to be treated like student debt. Now, to talk about that and more, we're joined by the Shadow Chief Secretary, Bridget Philipson. I'm um, keen to talk about your business plan, uh, but first, uh, if I may, I I'm keen to start on schools. We were just talking to Anne Longfield there about the impact uh, on children that the pandemic has had. The government wants schools to return from March the 8th. Does that need to be all schools, or would you be happy if primary schools, for example, or schools in some regions went, home, went in first? Well, the government does need to be very much guided by all of the science and the data that's made available to them. But absolutely, schools should be the first to open, which should be a real priority for the government to make sure that our children can get back to school. I mean, all parents will have seen the impact that being out of school for many children or the disruption to education uh, that's been caused, particularly for the most vulnerable children. You know, the fact that children can't play with their friends in the same way anymore. You know, the educational impact has been severe. But yes, we do absolutely need to see children, all children, back in school as quickly as possible. That just does need to be done safely say that all children should be back in school as quickly as possible, that it should be done safely. I mean, that is exactly what we'd hear from Dominic Raab a few moments ago as well. Um, should all schools and all year groups go back at the same time or would you be happy to see a staggered approach? Well, the government does need to consider the advice that they receive and it may be necessary to stagger that, but we will work with the government to make sure that it's done in a careful, considered way. Um, but we do also need to see a much clearer plan set out from the government around supporting children to catch up on the mislearning that they've had to experience, uh, but also making sure, as you heard just earlier from the Children's Commissioner, that we look at all of the impacts on children's wellbeing overall because you know, it has been a really difficult time. Children have lost out such a great deal, um, but we do need to make sure that when they go back, it's as safe as possible. So if the scientific advice is that it would be safer to, for example, allow younger children to uh, return first or to allow some year groups like those taking exams to return first, you'd be happy with that? We'll look at what the government says, but of course, we, the government should be guided uh, by the data from the science that's available and we'll look carefully at what they set out. It should be done in a measured way. I think parents and teaching staff will understand it has to be done carefully and following the best possible advice. OK, now we understand that Labour wants to allow businesses who have built up debt during the pandemic, I'm sure a lot of businesses that applies to, for that to be treated like student debt. Just explain the idea to us. We know that so many businesses have had a really, really tough year. I've heard from so many of them that they're really starting to find that debt mountain they've built up hard to deal with and they need breathing space to get through this crisis. So we don't believe that businesses should be paying back money that they've needed to borrow until they're in a much stronger position and until they're growing again. We know that in this country we've had the worst economic crisis of any major economy. And as right now, going into the next months ahead, 850,000 businesses are at risk and that puts two and a half million jobs on the line. We need to see urgent action from the government now to deal with that. They can't wait until the budget. They need urgent action from the Chancellor to help them get through this time. Some businesses, of course, may never be able to pay off the amount of debt that they have built up during this unbelievable year. So under your plan, could that debt be written off and effectively covered by the taxpayer in the same way that it is with student loans? Well, it's more likely that, that some of that debt will be written off if we don't take action now because businesses, many of them, particularly smaller businesses, are just drowning under this debt and they need to see real concerted action from the government. Of course, some businesses are in a stronger position, particularly some of those larger businesses, and we take a different approach there. But, you know, we've been listening to business. We know that they will be driving the recovery that we need to see, the growth that we need to see in job creation. So we need to be working with them to make sure that the solutions that we put in place don't see good businesses going bust uh, because of short-term decision-making. So it could, it could be written off is the answer? Well, unless we take action, debt will be written off, that's, that's for sure. So putting in place a plan that allows businesses to deal with this in a far more manageable way would be a responsible way to be approaching this. Businesses just don't understand why the Chancellor hasn't got to grips with the crisis that they're facing. He isn't listening. We also need to see, I believe, uh, a smart furlough introduced to support businesses to get through this. 
We also believe that the extension of the business rates holiday should continue, but also to see that further extension of the VAT cut. You know, so many businesses have found this a real struggle okay. over the course of the last year. And if they go bust, it will make our recovery so much harder. OK. Uh, of course, all of these plans will uh, cost money or take money as well. We've seen the worst fall in GDP since the invention of GDP this week. And many would like to see the Chancellor start to... Uh, rebalance the books, if you like, uh, when he has, uh, in the, gives the budget in March. Now, Keir Starmer said this week that over the course of the recovery, tax rises are not the right way to go. So are there any tax rises that Rishi Sunak could propose in the budget that you would support? You'll struggle to find an economic expert who believes that right now we should be raising taxes on families, whereas, in fact, the Chancellor is doing precisely that with his council tax hit. If we pressed ahead with tax rises now, that would pull demand out of our economy. It would mean that families have got less money to spend in our shops and high streets, and it would damage the recovery that I think we all want to see. You know, we are at a fork in the road now. Uh, we want to see Britain come back strongly and to emerge from this uh, terrible, terrible pandemic that we've experienced. But if the Chancellor presses ahead with tax rises, not only will it hurt families, but it will be economically illiterate. And as I say, you'd struggle to find anybody right now who's saying that tax rises on families are the right way to be going about this. I'm not talking about tax rises on families specifically. Are there any tax rises that Rishi Sunak could propose that Labour would support? Now, absolutely isn't the time to be pressing ahead with tax, uh, tax rises. That isn't okay. an approach that we would support. OK, thank you. Now, I just want to talk to you a little bit about... Labour. 116,000 people have now died after testing positive for Covid. We've seen the biggest economic hit since the Great Frost in 1709. And yet the Conservatives have actually managed to extend the poll lead uh, over Labour. They're lead leading Labour in the polls. Lots of people will be looking at that thinking, why isn't Labour doing better in the circumstances? Well, a little over a year ago, we suffered one of the worst general election defeats in our history. So we always knew that it was going to take a long time to regain the trust of the British people once more. But I think we've made tremendous progress over the course of that time under Keir Starmer's new leadership. If you'd said to me in December 2019 that we would have made the progress we've made already, I would have taken off your right arm to have been uh, making such fantastic progress. But of course, you know, after such a terrible defeat, it will take time to regain the trust of the British people once more. We've always been clear about that. Um, but at the same time, I think there is an expectation from the British people that we're constructive in the opposition that we put to the government. This is a crisis like no other, so we have pushed the government and given voice to the concerns that we've had, not least on the economic recovery, where because we've had the worst economic crisis of any major economy, we face a very difficult path back. And that's because going into this crisis, the country was built on weak economic foundations. But, you know, we're making great progress. Of course, of course, as a party, there is more to do. OK, and um, some on the left of the party are getting a little bit jittery. Uh, people like John McDonnell, like the Unite Union, wanting to see a June emergency conference to try and address some of their concerns. Now, those on the left, I guess, would like you to take a few more risks, to call for things that aren't just going to happen anyway, to differentiate uh, between Labour and the government. Is the problem that Labour at the minute is just a bit boring? Well, you no, know, we're years out from an election. So, of course, we'll set out very detailed policy that rises to the challenge that Britain faces at that point. Um, but we are in the middle of a pandemic, after all, and we absolutely have to be focused on getting the country through this crisis. But we have made tremendous progress as a party. But, you know, when I think back to that terrible election defeat uh, in December 2019, the first priority for us as a party had to be earning the right to be heard once more by the British people. We've done that. I think Keir Starmer has demonstrated that he is a prime minister, next prime minister for this country. He's ready to do that job. And there is genuine and real enthusiasm from people that I speak to about the progress that Labour has made. Of course, there is still much more that we need to do. We always knew it would be a tough road ahead. OK, thank you for coming on the show. It looks very picturesque and snowy where you are, but a bit chilly as well, so I hope you've got a nice cup of tea somewhere standing by. And uh, Thank you for being on. Thank you. Thanks, Ray. Well, that's it for a pretty busy show. Don't go anywhere. After the break, I'll be joined by our political correspondent, Rob Powell, to go through everything we learned in Sophie Rouge's The Take. And do check out the podcast too, available in all the usual places from lunchtime today. See you after this short break.